Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Friday, June 29th, 2012. Here's a quick look at what we have lined up for you this evening. Tonight, Michael Moore and the rest of the fake liberal establishment celebrate the upholding of Obamacare by the Supreme Court. Is the Second Amendment next? Also, fill me up, Scotty. William Shatner has a run-in with the TSA. And Darren McBreen sits down with Leslie Manukian, director of The Greater Good. They will shed light on this vaccine crisis that is currently enveloping America. All this and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, as you all know by now, yesterday the Supreme Court betrayed our republic and upheld Obamacare. And right on cue, Michael Moore is, well, he's declaring victory and celebrating the decision as he applauds the bill that was written, well, primarily by the very insurance companies he claims to oppose. So as George Orwell rolls in his grave, as the anti-corporate crusader says the Supreme Court's decision was a great victory. And it should be met with loud cheers throughout the country. But wait, there's more. There's Michael Moore yesterday on MSNBC. This uh, victory, I think, really should be a mandate uh, for all of us now to just keep moving forward so that everyone is covered and so that the private profit making insurance companies are not running the show. They're still running the show. That part, that piece of it is, is going to screw this thing up somewhere uh, down the line, people are, are still going to be hurt on some level because the decision about the bottom line is still going to be there. That has to be removed. So let me get this straight. Michael Moore, he's celebrating this as a victory, while at the same time, he's admitting that the for-profit insurance companies are still running the show. I don't get it. I mean... He didn't mention that the insurance companies, you know, they actually wrote the damn bill to begin with, but nothing to fear because Mitt Romney says he will repeal Obamacare if elected, which kind of reminds me of back when Obama campaigned, well, remember when he campaigned to close down Gitmo and repeal the Patriot Act. We all know how that turned out. Romney, obviously well aware that the vast majority of Americans are dead set against Obamacare, thus the... Well, the fairy tale campaign promise. Hey, now Alex Jones, you know, Alex has been telling you about Obamacare for years now, and it's always fun to go back in the archives and look at what he said uh, in the past. And uh, well, here's something from 2009 that still holds true today. Let's take a look. The last decade has been a horrible time for freedom. We've seen the Patriot Act, we've seen all these preemptive wars of aggression. We've seen the military being used more and more on the streets. We've seen the federal government triple under George W. Bush and now Obama has even broken that record. We were critics of George Bush tripling the size of government. It was hard to imagine that Barack Obama could do worse, but he has. He's dwarfed what Bush did because Barack Obama works for the very same private banks that Bush worked for and that Clinton worked for and that Bush senior before him was controlled by and they want the government deep in debt. The national polls are conclusive. The vast majority of the American people do not want big government-run health care. They don't want Obamacare. And there's this giant lie being pushed by all these different TV ads I see being run by Rock the Vote and others saying that insurance companies don't want this bill and the big corrupt banks are against it. Who do you think controls Obama? Who do you think controlled George W. Bush? The banks want big government. The insurance companies wrote this bill and that it forces the American people to buy their overpriced insurance. It takes money out of people's paychecks. It, it gives you five years in prison or quarter million dollar fines if you don't go out and get the insurance. And the way that they've gotten uh, it rammed through the Senate so far is completely illegal publicly promising hundreds of millions and in some cases billions of dollars of pork barrel to the senator states if they'll vote for it. It's incredible. And we have a headline story at prisonplanet.com uh, 
uh, titled, The Stock Prices of Insurance Companies Say It All. And it shows the graphs where the stock prices of the insurance companies out there are just exploding because they wrote this legislation. It's a tax to them where the American people have to buy their product and that it's also a tax to the federal government. We are a nation that has become bankrupt. Our dollar is dying because the world knows our government is spending more money than it can ever pay back. Ladies and gentlemen, government is a cancer. It is out of control. And the Republicans and the Democrats are addicted to big government. If we don't turn this around, this country is going to completely collapse. But the outrage doesn't stop there. We're seeing rhetoric out of the U.S. Senate and out of Chris Matthews and others on national television saying, if you oppose the big government takeover of health care, one-seventh to one-sixth of the economy, if you oppose that, you are a racist. What does that have to do with race? They're just race pimping and race baiting and injecting something into a debate that has nothing to do with it. In fact, I have the video clip here in front of me. There's an article up at uh, Infowars.net by Steve Watson. Senator calls two-thirds of Americans opposing health bill right-wing militias and racists. Doesn't the establishment realize their last shreds of credibility are being destroyed? You're, you're now a white supremacist if you don't want to be under government control? And by the way, in the bill, the death panels are still there. That's what they are in Europe. It's what they are in Canada. Tom Daschle wrote a book saying if you're above 60, and he's the guy that wrote the original bill, uh, that you don't need eye surgery, that you don't need to be able to get the same medical care as a young person. This is eugenics. This is health care rationing. And we've got another story here that says health care bill death panels could only be repealed with super majority. And uh, we now have the subsection of the bill, section 3403 of the final version of the bill, says that it will take a super majority in the future, they're writing this into the bill, to be able to repeal any of this and to be able to repeal uh, the death panels. So it just goes on and on and on. And yes, it's being reported that under Obamacare, be prepared to wait 18 months to see a doctor. Another facet of this government takeover of health care is that it's another broken promise from Barack Obama. The guy that said he wouldn't hire any lobbyist, hired more lobbyists than anybody before him. The guy that said he was going to get rid of the Patriot Act and he voted to expand it. The guy that said he was going to get all the troops out of Iraq immediately and now he says basically never. The guy who has broken every promise uh, that he made to the American people said that if you made less than $125,000 a year individually or $250,000 per couple that you would see no tax increases. And now in the health care bill, and we have all the subsections linked up on prisonplanet.com so you can read it for yourself. Don't believe us. Read it for yourself. There are at least 10 new massive taxes in the legislation against the American people. And the title of that article is Health Care Bill is a Huge Tax Hike. And we're going to post all the links uh, up in the corner uh, of the screen so that uh, you can go and read those for yourself. So even if you're for government-run socialist health care, you have to understand that Barack Obama is breaking his promises. Now, a lot of conservatives are against this bill because they realize it's a boondoggle. They realize that government uh, certainly can't deliver care better than the private sector. Uh, they understand that it's a way for the government to control our lives and uh, ration care. But real leftists, real socialists, real people who do believe in immoral uh, asset redistribution, they are against this bill. And Dennis Kucinich is against it, saying it's a giant uh, bailout for insurance companies. The insurance companies on record wrote the legislation. Howard Dean has come out saying this is a horrible deal because it cuts $41 million a year from Medicare and Medicaid. That's a conservative estimate. So your taxes go up, but the so-called free health care goes down. Taxes go up, the services go down. This whole thing is a giant fraud. But in closing... Every major poll states that between 60 to 65, and some polls, 70 percent 
of the American people are against this bill. And that's why Harry Reid is in a big hurry to pass it, because they know every day that people have a chance to look into this legislation, the more people are going to wake up and speak out against it. And so that's why they're trying to stampede this through with this blitzkrieg. But real big government types, real people who believe in wealth redistribution have come out and said this is a corporate looting, a scam, a fraud. Look, they told you back in 2008, in October, that the banker bailout bill was going to be used immediately to unfreeze mortgage lending. On October 4th, the day after they passed it, Paulson said, we're not going to tell you where the money's being spent, but we're not going to spend it on mortgages now. It's the same thing on everything they do. It turns into a fraud. Take the greenhouse gas taxes. You know, it turned out that they weren't going to cut any of the greenhouse gases, even if you believe they're bad, but it was going to be given as tax money to the private IMF and World Bank. Our government has been seized by offshore criminal banks. They are looting us. It is a private corporate takeover. And the bigger the government gets, the more money there is for big corporations to loot from the people. Big, powerful offshore corporations use government to rob you. Get that straight. And Howard Dean and Dennis Kucinich on the fake left are awake telling you this is a fraud. And then all the right-wingers are telling you it's a fraud. It is a fraud. But the elites in Washington, they want it, and they want to control your lives. We have a moderate chance of beating this. Uh, certainly it's going to be political suicide for those that pass it, but they don't care. They'll go to the revolving door into corporate insurance company jobs as the insurance company stocks explode as it looks like this bill is about to pass. Uh, but we do have a chance to maybe beat it in the House. The House has already passed it. The Senate's set to pass it, but they have to go into conference committee and try to get the two bills straightened out. So put pressure on that House committee uh, that's over health care and just do whatever you can to educate the American people that this is a giant scam and a fraud. The news is reporting that right at 50% of the people in Detroit are unemployed. Ladies and gentlemen, that was another government boondoggle that was going to save everyone. NAFTA and GATT, look what it did. And it's the same thing with this health care. We will regret the day that this was rammed through. Our nation is being bankrupted by design, as Maury Strong at the UN said, they want to destroy our industrial society to make us dependent on government. They love the crisis. As Rahm Emanuel said, don't let a good crisis go to waste. They want to run your lives. They're wreckers. They love to destroy things so they can go in and loot them. Now, Gun Owners of America, which is a nonprofit organization lobbying to protect our Second Amendment, well, they are saying that we can expect further erosion of our constitutional rights through Obamacare. It says here that the central, uh, excuse me, the centralizing these medical records will allow the FBI to troll a list of Americans to deny them their gun rights in the same way they've already denied more than 150,000 veterans their right to bear arms. For example, medical care providers now routinely ask patients if they are if there are guns in the home and add that information to their medical records so down the slippery slope we go as the well the control freak federal government continues to well they're determined to micromanage every aspect of our lives next up we have an update on fast and furious as the house yesterday voted to hold Attorney General Eric Holder in contempt. And this, of course, for shipping guns into Mexico. They're saying that this might be, or this might compel Holder to hand over the documents, 700 plus pages of them, that he, along with Barack Obama, would rather not have scrutinized by the public, or the InfoWars team, for that matter. Holder could even do a year in jail, but I seriously doubt that will ever happen. But interesting develop, uh, developments nonetheless, as this scandal certainly has the potential to become, well, it could be Obama's Watergate. And we'll keep you posted as that unfolds. Hey, and did you hear about this? William Shatner got humiliated today at L.A. International Airport. Actually, uh, what happened apparently... The TSA decided to single him out for a groping session. He was wearing some loose-fitting pants without a belt. His pants fell down in front of everyone. 
I'd imagine this got lots of people's attention, you know, by onlookers who obviously recognized him as a movie star. They're probably curious to see what was happening. Well, they got more than what they bargained for as William Shatner's pants fell down, exposing his underwear. Shatner said it was probably the most embarrassing moment he's ever experienced, but, um, you know, I guess the TSA and Homeland Security, you know, you never know. Maybe they thought Captain Kirk could be with Al-Qaeda. You never can be too sure about these things. But I guess it's the new freedom. You know, we've got to get used to it. The TSA plans to expand their Viper program, and it's going to include, well, let's see, bus terminals, train stations, and even expand all the way out to roadside vehicle inspections. So we have that to look forward to. All right, speaking of Captain Kirk, we finally have some good news to share with you this evening, or better yet, some real sci-fi news. This from giantfreakingrobot.com. It's humanity's greatest achievement, according to the website anyway, as Voyager 1 the space probe that originally launched back in 1977 has escaped. Well, it finally escaped our solar system anyway, and it's the first man-made object ever to do so, officially anyway. So it now enters uncharted and unknown territory deep in space to seek out new life, new civilizations, to boldly go where no man or no probe has gone before. I'm sure William Shatner would appreciate that news, even though it's really not getting much uh, media attention for some reason. But anyway, there you have it. Hey, now it's time for Alex Jones to announce the official InfoWars Reporter Contest winner. And, uh, well, he announced it officially earlier today, but now we're going to announce it here on the Nightly News. I don't know who it is. I purposely did not let anybody tell me because I wanted to see who it was for the first time, along with most of you tonight on our program. And I have a pretty good idea, but I'm not 100%. So here's Alex Jones announcing the winner. Hey out there, it's Rob Dew, and I'm with InfoWars Nightly News. I'm sitting here with Alex Jones right now, and we are actually going to announce here at this very table at this instant what you've all been waiting for. It's the winner of the mail reporter contest. So uh, without further ado, Alex is going to go over. Uh, we've whittled down the top ten to a few more finalists and we'll tell you the winner right now exactly we're going to tell you the winner so and i wanted you in here for this because we're going to air this on a nightly news tonight because right. rob you've done a great job with the rest of the crew helping go through 600 plus great entries it's been grueling everybody yeah. that entered is a winner in the fight for liberty and freedom citizen journalism activism i mean even the most amateur videos exhibited zeal for freedom and for taking action and getting on the street and got saw by, you know, 500 to 1,000 people. Some of these videos have been seen by 20,000 people. And so you've got 600-plus good videos. There were a few hundred that didn't follow any of the rules that got cut. Right. But over 600 total. That's why it took us two months and two days to even announce the female winner, as we did last night. Right. And again, I'm looking at our budget. I'm looking at what we're doing. I would like to hire two or three of the women. I'd like to hire them all. I mean, they just did such a great job, the finalists. But we're going to – so just because you lose uh, the first place doesn't mean you've lost because we want to talk to you. We want to try to interview you. We want to try to uh, come to an agreement so that we can hire uh, several of the women and several of the men or maybe more and get you here. I'm, I'm, I'm checking our budget, looking at the accounting. Uh, we're a true grassroots organization, um, but I'm looking at expending the extra funds we've got as emergency backup because why not have like four or five new reporters who can also edit? So, so, yeah. so winning the contest does not necessarily mean you get the job. And by the way, I'm honored that you want to work here. I'm honored that you want to fight the globalist. I am, you know, a a, a brother in arms with all of you, uh, and so. Um, I'm not up here like, like it's some type of talent show going, oh, you're very lucky that uh, we're, you know, considering you. This is something that's exciting, and it's exciting to see your excitement and your energy when it comes to fighting these people is the point I'm making. And I feel really bad 
that everybody couldn't win. I'll say that right now. I feel terrible because the passion and the energy that you all put in was amazing. Well, and one thing I'd like to say is there, there was a few guys who did multiple entries, and you saw the progression of them, you know, starting off with just a camera, and it's a little shaky, and then by the end, uh, there's one guy I remember in particular, his name was Kyle Phillips, and by the end, he was shooting green screen and, you know, doing more graphics and all kinds of things. So people got better throughout this contest. People were doing more. You reports. just hit the nail on the head. That's I mean, what I was going to say because I, I never. it was amazing. I, I, I hardly ever write notes, and I didn't today. I, I meant to add earlier without even talking to you that, folks, even if you didn't win here, it shows that you can report on information. You can reach people, yep. whether it's with commentary or analysis or investigative reporting. Just because you're not going to win, some of you, most of you, it doesn't matter. You have won by getting in the arena, by not being spectators, by taking action. Start your own reporting. Do an access show. Start a local radio show. It's easier than you think. I'm not that good at this. I just have a will to continue to fight. That's why we reach millions of people a day, Rob. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's pretty much the thing that I was really impressed with. People's just, the quality that increased, and, and our top ten I mean, the quality is there. I mean, you've really got, you've got a No, we had it down to the top 10 two or three weeks ago, but just couldn't decide. And, yeah. and I'm normally decisive. Uh, I just, I love all these people. I mean, I love oh, all good. the entries. Uh, Jennifer Collins, who we were supposed to announce the male and female winner, $5,000 to the male winner, $5,000 to the female winner last night. But as of showtime, I couldn't decide. No, we were all in a room, like literally arguing about who we should pick you know, for this. And, you know, you wanted our input. We, you know, I, I let all the guys send me input. I showed it to you. I said, this is, these are the people who we think are the- We also had voting. Country. We had the voting going on. And, you know, the voting wasn't scientific, so you could sit there and re repeatedly vote. But I think it gave us a good gauge of, like, who people really liked in terms of what reports they liked and what, what reporters they liked overall, the other people out there. And it gave them a choice. And, you know, I was talking with the guys, and they said, it's not going to be uh, scientific, the IT guys. But I said, you know what, let's just give, let people go out there, give them a voice. And, you know, if somebody is really into just voting for themselves, well, that's, I mean, that's weird. But I guess some people would do that. But I can also, you know, point out here that I, in the final equation, because not everybody was unanimous about this, I have picked people that I personally think are the best. Right. In what we've seen of their production. Now, given another shot at it, I might have voted for somebody else. Uh, let me go over the five or six finalists that we really, really had trouble choosing from because they were all so good. Uh, David Ortiz did a really professional, you know, standard report, great poise, great voice, a great topic that he covered. Um, he interviewed Gary Johnson. Yes, and, and, and he is not the winner. But we like to talk to him about coming to work for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, but he was right there. Um, I mean, I can't even say who's second place out of all these. I know. I think it's. Um... We had big debates uh, about David Knight. Just yeah. really came off as authoritative. Nice graphics that he had. Calm and collected, but inform, informative. Yeah, very authoritative. Yeah, very uh, he got you know the third most votes. Uh, Ortiz, what he got the second to... Uh, he was he was kind of down. David Ortiz was down at the bottom of the top yeah, ten. Yeah, he was the second to the last. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. It was in but the top ten. as of like two hours ago. I went back. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's always changing. It's but the changing. point is, yeah. he was in the top ten. Um, David Knight, David, you're not the winner, but we want to talk to you about hiring you. Oh, and the good news is, if we can't afford somebody full-time or they can't come here, yeah. they can be a correspondent. And we can pay them some mm -hmm. and, and also promote what they're doing. We just want to get the word out and work with these great people. Sure. Amazing job, David. Uh, you're a great reporter, great presence. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll end up uh, working something out with us and being right here in the Info Wars Command Center. So uh, both you guys, fabulous. I mean, I mean, the problem is I'm like, you know, looking at all this talent to fight tyranny, and I want them all. Yeah. Because I, mean, I want to build an army against these guys. And it's you, the subscribers of PrisonPlanet.tv, that are helping build this whole system that we then put out on the radio and reach millions and the Internet. So, again, thank you for doing this. Because without you guys out there, without your support, we couldn't do this. So if you're watching on YouTube or somewhere else later, subscribe to PrisonPlanet.tv. See it all when it first airs, all the films, everything, because I'm always realizing, whoa, I've got to make money to be able to hire these people right. because I want to get info weapons downrange. Yeah. I mean, this is so exciting. I'm ranting. Teleprompter free, folks. 
Now, this guy, he got the most votes. And, By far. Uh, tell us about this fellow. This is Dave Brinkman, and uh, he had a great intro, uh, you know, as a panning shot, and he got the good music, and, he's, you know, he's reporting he's got that mustache that a lot of people seem to like. Um, and it, it, his is all about fluoride. He did a great job editing with uh, asking people the different questions about fluoride. A lot of people didn't know what it was. Or, you know, some people, one guy said it's, you know, the, the tap water is the best stuff on earth and great for his immune system, clearly uninformed about fluoridated water. And then he goes to the uh, city council, brings up these issues, and then he went on to do a new segment. So he kind of did the, the three, uh, well, you know, he, he did a, uh, on his report, he covered all the bases. You know, he did on the field reporting, he did interviews. The point is he did a great job, he great but he, job. Is, he is not the winner. But he wins by getting involved, and we'd like to talk to him about coming to work in InfoWars. Problem is, if I hire, like, all six of these people, yeah. uh, I mean, the, they'll all do a great job, but, I mean, where do we even put it all? I mean, all the media. We'll have to, like, start multiple shows or something, <laughs> which is actually my plan down the road. So, again... 24-hour news network. Yeah, well, that's been the plan, but yeah. amazing job. Uh, he is definitely a very close second. Yeah. But they all are. The Stuart Howe. Yeah, we've known Stuart Howe for years. He's couldn't have a better heart. Couldn't yeah. be more informed. Um, years ago, wanted to be a reporter here. Stuart, you're not the winner, but... You probably will be the winner getting a job coming to work here. Yeah. Again, if I've got the funds and I'm able to do it and figure it all out, we're even looking to get in the space next door because we filled up this this facility. I love how Stuart is able to confront people, but without you know being loud or anything. He's just he's very calm about it, and it's just like sticking you know sticking the proverbial knife into you. Very really professional. Of it was it was uh, good. just a, you know soft power. Yes. And uh, Stuart, you're awesome. You were in the you know top five or six. I mean. The, Again, with the ladies, I showed three or four, but with the guys, there's like six that we really had debates about. Now, yeah. when it comes to just pure heart yeah. and somebody you want to hang out with and have around the office. He's like a rugby player. Tell us about like this guy. Dan Badandi. I mean, really got, I, I've actually become a fan of his videos. I, I love the, you know, the Northeastern accent, the headstrongness, the ability to just stand, stand up. Stand up to cops. 20 cops. Yeah, you know, there's a video of him out there just standing up to all these police and filming them. Uh, you know, it was a situation that probably would have gone differently if he would have been there filming them, you know, causing a stink of his own. They had some guy in the patrol car, and they're like, "Mind your own business, get out of here." And he's like, "No, you're not going to violate my First Amendment." And he stood there, stood his ground, and then that was his great report. We could talk about all you guys for ten hours, but by the time we dump this video <laughs> down and convert it, the show will be over. Right. So, uh, Dan Badandi, we'd like to talk to you about coming to work for Infowars, uh, or at. All of you guys, we want you to be correspondents, and that's paid correspondents. Yeah. Because we want reporters all over the country. I tell you, this contest was the best idea we ever had. It was awesome. It was Whose idea was it? I, I think we, it, it might have been, I think it was your idea, but it was collectively, like, you know, getting the rules. That was a big. All of these problem. people are incredible. And now for the drum roll, we have the winner. And, uh, do I'll let you announce the winner. Wow. All right. Um, okay, this is it. Congratulations, Jakari Jackson. You won. You're our male reporter winner for the InfoWars Reporter Contest of 2012. And, so uh, Jennifer Collins and Jakari Jackson. Yeah. And again, this guy uh, did a you know really good professional report. He's got a great voice. He's got a great voice. Uh, I mean, this guy is just, just everything comes together. This is the InfoWars Reporter anchor. This is somebody we definitely... Definitely want to work something out and get him down here from yeah. Oklahoma, right here in Austin. We want to hire you, buddy. We have a skeleton crew. We're always so busy producing all this that we'll we'll try to get in touch with you next week and get it all worked yeah. out and, uh, you know, do teleconference or Skype interviews there, buddy. But we ought to just try to get I'm gonna all six of these guys yeah. and the three or four ladies, we ought to all fly them in here. Like when I get back from okay. that investigation in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And maybe spend two days with them or something and, and, and try to figure it all out. There you go. That, I think that sounds like a great idea. Um, I'm going to be contacting all the guys anyway, getting uh, having you guys send me resumes. And we'll we got to send also the two winners five thousand dollars piece. Well, yeah, that's going to happen. There's a there's a little uh, tax paperwork they need to fill out. That's the that's right. We stuff. to the Federal Reserve, the yeah. folks that run our health care now. We well, yes. we do jump through all the hoops around here we're fighting the new world order saying they're murderers, which they are, but we, we don't give them excuses to come after us. Well, show. you could spend your time fighting them, or you could spend your time fighting the bigger problems out there. Exactly. We're going, we're discrediting the whole system. But yes, exactly. we, we, we follow all the stupid fraudulent laws here. We do. Anyways, because if they ever set us up, it's going to be a setup.
Anyways, uh, so Jakari Jackson, great name, too. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's funny. They both start with J, both of the reporters. I didn't even realize that till just now. It's Jennifer and Jakari. Yep. Well, so. that's it. That's, that's who the winners are. Why did we... Uh, I mean, the voice, uh, the style of reporting, it just was very credible, mm -hmm. uh, everything. Yeah, he had... He, I want he this guy to cut ads for us, the radio voice. He had a sense of, of rhythm and, uh, you know, and, and he also was able to pull in, you know, OKC, which is one of those false flags that, you know, is still lingering. And, and he's very, never, uh, very personable. Yeah. Yeah, he was an interview of a majority or a variety of people. Charming. Out in the, out in the field. And, and they're all know, charming in, yeah. in their own ways. And, you know, he didn't have the best graphics or you know, uh, amazing motion graphics or anything going on in his video. And that's not what it's all about. Being a reporter is about being able to get in there and ask the questions. Like, that's why we like Dan Bedondi. He got in there and he asked, you know, he got that question in front of Ron Paul, which not a lot of people have been able to do. Hey, I videos. am, I'm never worried about sponsorship and I never even plug stuff. I'm like, this week, I'm like, make money, make money, because yeah. I want to hire all these guys. <laughs> I, can you imagine the army we'd have if we we can get, you know, seven or eight reporters? Well, I mean, but I want to hire three or four of those great ladies, and yeah. then there's all these, we can't. I don't know what we're going to do, man. I mean, I'm like a kid at Christmas, you know. I mean, I'm going to the store, and I've got enough money to get one of the toys, you know. I want to, like, right. I mean, because I just, I just think of, like, all these great minds to go out and fight tyranny. Because, you know, that's why I get you guys on air. You're like, I don't yeah. want to go on air. I'm like, dude, you're great. Go on air. You have a great job. Aaron didn't want to go on air totally in a Aaron, yeah. in a year of doing news and stuff. Is he not kicking butt now? He is. I mean, you could just send him, you know, we don't even have to go over much. I just say, here's the everybody's story. got the potential, but you guys and gals stood up, took action, did it. And the response was incredible. Over 600 good entries. All of you. We love you. We appreciate you. We thank you. Uh, we've got Jennifer Collins and Jakari Jackson. Uh, $5,000 is on the way. And should we give your email out here on air or will it get swamped? I, I guess they know how to contact yeah, you. Yeah, no, Rob D at InfoWars.com. R O B D at InfoWars.com. Yeah. So send all that over. We'll get your checks out next week. Yep. And uh, we'll start doing some uh, you know, preliminary talk. I mean, do you want to move here? Do you want the job? Because right. it's always people like, well, the person that wins is the reporter. No, you win the money. And now will you be the reporter? Right. But like I said, I always plan to probably hire two women and two men. That's our budget. Right. But. If you buy enough pro pure water filters, we can hire all these people. And I mean, can you I imagine, great. but in a way it'd be good off the whole pool. There's so many other good people. Yeah. If, if we had regional reporters, then there's the management of that though. Yeah. But, but I mean, think of that. We can just call on anybody. Well, that's kind of what we have now. Patrick Henningsen, as you know, kind of in England, decided he's going to start interviewing people, and he's been sending us great stuff. You know, you got Max Kaiser, he got um, the guy from who was the Seven Seven Intelligence. All officer. of them, all of them. It's and just, I mean, it's just amazing stuff. David and, Ike, yeah, David Ike. I mean, and he, and he got David Ike right before. What was crazy is he's a good writer. Yeah, uh, he was an American living in England, uh, managing bars. And he'd been on my show a few times, and I said, you know, why don't you write articles for us and yeah. post, you know, be a weekend poster? And he kind of like started just doing these video interviews. Well, here they are. And we, yeah. okay, well, all right. This is going to be the real challenge, though. Once we get all these people in here, we've never been like a corporate management thing. But at a certain point, we're going to have to bring some controls in. Right. Just just because, I mean, I'm already running around. People are like, well, look at this, look at that. I, I, look, an exciting adventure is before us. Exactly. And so congratulations to everybody. We want to throw it back now to Darren McBreen hosting InfoWars Nightly News, congratulations to Jakari Jackson and Jennifer Collins. Hope that we're able to work something out and have you join the InfoWars Command Center. All right, so congratulations, Jakari Jackson and Jennifer Collins, who won yesterday. On behalf of everyone here at InfoWars, we are certainly excited to meet you. Looking forward to hanging out. Well, I hope we're going to hang out. So I hope that means you got the job and you're moving to Austin. So, uh, and for those of you that didn't make the top 10, don't be discouraged because all of you are multi-talented and if you keep it up, chances are you'll be part of the InfoWars crew one day as well. I can tell you that even though we didn't win, we're all kind of, well, all of us here are Dan Bedondi fans. He's kind of the office favorite. So, uh, Dan, if you're ever in Austin, Texas, I'm buying the first round, okay? First round's on me, all right? Hey, now we're going to go to the quote of the day. This one's by Dan Bedondi. Ah, just kidding. Uh, that would be kind of cool, though, if Dan Bedondi could come in here and, and read the quotes every day. <laughs> I would love it. Now this one's from Arthur Schlesinger. Here it is. 
We are not going to achieve a new world order without paying for it in blood, as well as in words and money. That's Arthur Schlesinger. Oh, isn't that nice? Hey, Arthur, I'm your huckleberry. Come and take it. I dare you. All right, that's going to do it for the first half of our show. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to take a look at the new award-winning documentary, The Greater Good. We're also going to talk with Leslie Manukian, the film's writer and producer. Uh, so we're going to take a look at uh, the official trailer. We're going to show you a few clips. And if you thought you knew everything about vaccinations, think again. We'll be right back after this. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at Infowars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. And once again, I'm your host, Darren McBreen. And coming up next, we are going to take a look at the new powerful documentary film, The Greater Good. And this takes a look at the, well, the government's vaccination policies. And, well, it's an amazing must-see documentary. It's one in film festivals all across the country as well as internationally. I watched it for the first time earlier this week, and I personally think it's the, well, one of the best documentary films that I have ever seen. And this is the perfect tool that we can use not only to educate, but to affect change as well. The DVD is available right there at InfoWarsShop.com. We're going to take a look at the trailer right now. This is the official trailer, and here's a sneak peek at the greater good on the InfoWars Nightly News. Two years ago, a vaccine completely changed my life. I would do anything to get my life back to normal. <laughs> History teaches us how effective vaccines are. Vaccines are the best choice for almost all children. I don't think it's that black and white. Vaccines in some way have been a victim of their own success. The government, they're trying to protect society, but these motivations interfere with, you know, safety issues. In the last three decades, the numbers of doses of vaccines have more than tripled. We are seeing a rise in the number of children with disabilities. What if these shots that are supposed to protect kids actually hurt your child? After the shots, I started getting sick. I've had two strokes, partial paralysis, partial vision, and I'm having seizures. I would have never dreamt that this was a side effect of a vaccine. Many of these have the potential to be neurotoxic. The research is incomplete, and the certainty is not Scientific. A number of prescription drugs that have been licensed as safe have been found to be unsafe. For the social fabric, it is better to insist on vaccination than to allow free reign. The people who are approving the vaccines are taking the word of the pharmaceutical companies. The majority of vaccine research is paid for by the vaccine manufacturers themselves. We're the only country other than New Zealand that allows advertising on TV for pharmaceutical drugs. You can't sue the drug company that made the vaccine. That's not science, that's politics. Texas Governor Rick Perry has ordered that schoolgirls must get the Gardasil shot. We can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. The only thing that we oppose is forced vaccination. Sadly, some people don't do what's best for their children unless it's mandated. 
We're not zealots. We're not um, some people that are looking for a conspiracy or a fight. The vaccine program, it's one size fits all. We worry about the future. You could have 30, 40, 50 different vaccines mandated and absolutely no accountability. You have a prescription for disaster. I have a child and then I follow the rules and I damage this child. That's hard for me to understand. I just want everybody to lay down their arms and figure out what is making them so sick. Show us the science and give us the choice. And we are joined now by Leslie Manukian, who is the writer and producer of this film. And Leslie, right out of the gate, let me just say congratulations on a job well done. It's truly an amazing documentary, and we're excited and honored to have you with us today. Thank you so, so much. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here. Well, tell us about the film, break down some of the highlights, and tell us why it's a good idea for people to, to go see it. Well, you know, I think it would be a surprise to anybody that there's a vaccine debate raging in this country, and um, not just in this country, but around the world. And um, I didn't really understand the debate over 10 years ago. I thought that there was really nothing to it. Um, but I was working on Wall Street, actually living in London and working in finance, and I met somebody who told me that vaccines could cause harm. And I thought, come on, this guy's nuts. I mean, he's he's got to be whacked. There's something wrong with him. But he gave me a book and he told me to read it. And in the back of the book, there were over 900 references to mainstream medical literature, um, studies published in peer-reviewed medical literature. And I thought, gosh, you know, I really need to look into this more. And I vowed that one day after I read that book, I was going to go and figure this out for myself and look at these officials and talk to these people and look them in the eye. And I've been stunned to find out that we are actually in a situation where our kids are really sick. Over 50% of American children are chronically ill. 20% right. are developmentally disabled. And there's growing science that links it to vaccinations. Now, you know, who would have thought that was the case? And I certainly wouldn't have 10 years ago when I first started thinking about this issue. But the science is mounting, and we're now seeing that there's really serious cause for concern. And so we made this film because we want people to understand that the whole vaccination conversation is a conversation worth having, that there is science out there that calls into question the safety of vaccines, and we need to explore this further so we can get to the bottom of what's causing our kids to be so sick. Um, that's really the gist of it, and we just hope that more and more people will open their hearts and open their minds um, and understand that there may be something going on here that we really all should care about. Well, I think it's a, the best and, and most effective vaccination film that I've ever seen. And, and now we finally have something uh, in our hands. We, we have an opportunity to both educate and to, uh, to get people out there to do something about this. I think this will create change, you know, or affect change, if you will. And um, one of the things is, uh, Guys, I got to start over again. I'm sorry, because I lost my train of thought. Just what, come out of the, the, the clip right there. All right, sorry. All right, ready, go. Sorry, Leslie. No worries. But what we're doing is we're getting the clip ready, so it just kind of threw me off. Don't worry. The, okay, so, all right. Well, I think this is the best vaccination film that I've ever seen, and I think we have something here that will not only educate people, but it'll also affect change as well, because this is really a splash in your face wake up call to everyone who sees it. Now, I want to play a few clips from the film. We're going to start out with a look at the rise of chronic illness as children with disabilities have now reached epidemic levels. Is only one kind of brain and immune dysfunction that is associated with vaccination. Millions and millions of children now in America are chronically ill and disabled. And during the same time period that the numbers of doses of vaccines have more than tripled that we're giving our children, we have seen this explosion of chronic disease and disability. And to take off the table, the use of a pharmaceutical product like a vaccine as a potential cofactor in this explosion of chronic disease and disability among our children is irresponsible. 
And that was Barbara Lowe Fisher. She is the president of the National Vaccine Information Center, also one of the many heroes that are featured in this amazing documentary, The Greater Good. Now, uh, Barbara Lowe Fisher, she actually dedicated her life to this. Her son, unfortunately, fell victim to a vaccination some 30 years ago. He got the shot, he became brain damaged, and she became committed to reforming the vaccination system. Again, one of the many heroic and courageous people that are featured in this documentary. Now, tell us more about the chronic illness epidemic that we're facing right now. I mean, everywhere you look, there's children with disabilities. Well, I, I don't know how old you are, Darren, but I'm 48 years old, and when I was a kid, I don't remember anybody being sick. There were no obese kids. There were no people with asthma. There were, you know, if someone had asthma, it was extremely rare. I didn't know a single person with a peanut allergy or any kind of allergy for that matter. And today, um, we know from a study that was published in Academic Pediatrics last year that over 50% of American children have some kind of chronic illness or disability. So these are things like asthma, allergies, eczema, learning disabilities, speech delay, yes, autism, many other things, lupus, multiple sclerosis, um, arthritis, and things like this. We're even seeing these in, in kids nowadays. Um, and what's interesting is that not only is there this explosion of chronic illness, but as I mentioned before in the introduction, there's actually science linking those things to the aluminum in vaccines, the mercury in vaccines, other components of vaccines, or just vaccines in general. And I think it's really critical, obviously, when you get to a point where over 50% of your kids have some chronic illness or disability, that we seriously take a hard look at this. And um, it's irresponsible for health authorities to be claiming that there is no connection anymore because there's such a growing body of science suggesting that there is a link. Well, I'm the same age as you are. I'm, I'm 45 years old, and the same with me. Uh, when I was in, in grown up in school, it was very rare that, uh, that anybody was, had a disability, and I went to some very big schools in Phoenix, Arizona. Now, here's something that I bet most people aren't aware of as well, but you are not allowed to sue the drug companies that manufacture the vaccines. So I, I guess we're finally living in the twilight zone. Big government has stepped in to protect big pharma. Meanwhile, our children remain unprotected. Here's mm. another clip from The Greater Good. The first thing that we learned is you can't, you can't sue the drug company that made the vaccine. Our lawyer explained to us how there was this court set up specifically to address all the vaccine injuries. Uh, there were a lot of uh, civil lawsuits against uh, vaccine manufacturers, and there were some extraordinary awards because there were very devastating injuries. So the vaccine uh, manufacturer said, this isn't profitable for us, we're not gonna make vaccines anymore. So Congress stepped in and said, okay, we're going to um, stop lawsuits against manufacturers, and you're not allowed to sue them unless you first go through this new program that we're setting up called the Vaccine Compensation Program, or the Vaccine Court. So the vaccine makers have immunity, and our elected or so-called elected officials no doubt sold out. Meanwhile, they're trying to make vaccines mandatory and, and they have no accountability, zero accountability. So, you know, this is insane. Tell us about how they set up the court system in favor or to protect Big Pharma. Well, essentially what happened was in the early 1980s, many children were um, killed by the DPT vaccine or suffered permanent brain damage from the DPT vaccine. And Britain actually did a study called the National Childhood Encephalopathy Study that found out that this is what was happening, that this DPT, the diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccine was causing a tremendous amount of harm to children. And so the United States did a follow-up and found out that yes, indeed, this was happening. And what happened was all these parents went and sued and there were huge payouts. And so the pharmaceutical industry basically threatened the government and said, you know, we'll stop making vaccines if you don't start protecting us. Um, rather than making safer products, they threatened the government and the government actually went along with it, essentially. And what happened was Ronald Reagan signed into law something called the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1986. And this law was supposed to make it easy for parents who'd had their children be injured by vaccines, make it easy for them to go and apply for compensation. 
But what's happened in the last 25 years since it came to be is that um, the table of compensable events has been gutted so that it's almost impossible to get compensated now. And what happened was they set up this program, which people call the vaccine court, um, where you actually have to go to if you want to if you want to claim that your child was injured by a vaccine, mm. and the court and the whole trust fund that pays out to the families um, is funded by a tax that is actually levied on every single vaccine that's given in America. So people don't realize when you take your kid in to get them vaccinated, there's a 75 cent tax on every vaccination, and that 75 cents goes into this trust fund that then pays out to you or somebody else if their child is injured by a vaccine. And while the idea was that it would help make it a no fault system, what's happened is it's just been completely corrupted in the last 25 years. And so now we've gotten to a point where the pharmaceutical industry bears zero liability. And in fact, last year, the Supreme Court ruled that even if the vaccine makers could have made a safer vaccine, you can't even sue in civil court anymore. So there is actually zero recourse. You go to the vaccine court, if you don't get any kind of um, suitable response, you have no other options. And as far as I know, there's no other product in the world today for which the maker bears zero liability. I mean, what incentive do they have to actually create a safer product when they have no liability? And so now we're facing a situation where literally there are hundreds of new vaccines under development and they have no liability. I mean, it's just insanity. Yeah, we've got we've got all these uh, new vaccines under development, and now they have fast tracking, which is the FDA's process of speeding up the drug trials in order to get these vaccinations out there and, and into the public in a hurry. Um, in fact, we have another clip. Let's play the uh, the fast tracking clip. This is about the fast tracking of Gardasil. Let's take a look. The FDA has a particular process that's called fast tracking when there is a promising drug that comes forward. Gardasil, they had scheduled a four year trial, but after 15 months, they went to the FDA and said, There is nothing like this vaccine on the market. Would you please consider this for fast track? And the FDA said, Yes. So within six months, they approved it. And as soon as they had it approved, Merck said, we will no longer continue our trial. We're going to stop our trial because our drug is now approved. So therefore, we don't know the long-term side effects. We do know there have been reports of pancreatitis, reports of autoimmune disease, reports of transverse myelitis, and reports of juvenile ALS, which is uniformly fatal in adolescents. And that was another scene from the explosive documentary, The Greater Good, which is available at InfoWarsShop.com. You can also uh, purchase the DVD at GreaterGoodMovie.org. And Leslie, I know you're aware that here in Texas, we have Governor Rick Perry, the corrupted slime ball imbecile that he is. Uh, he actually made it mandatory. He, ma he had all the schools, he said all the schools have to give Gardasil shots. And lo and behold, we learn that he indeed has connections to the pharmaceutical industry. So there's a blatant conflict of interest here. And I wanted to get your take on not just with Rick Perry, but, you know, the revolving door that we seem to have between the pharmaceutical industry and federal agencies. You know, it is something that's very troubling. Um, what Rick Perry did was amazing. I mean, he actually signed an executive order decreeing that all kids should get this. Executive orders are for emergencies, not for something that's not even easily communicable. But um, the um, <clears throat> what's really at stake here is that there is no firewall between the pharmaceutical industry, CDC, and FDA. And there's a problem with that in that members of the committees who make decisions about which vaccines will and won't be recommended by the CDC actually are patent holders. They have a financial interest. They are consultants or direct employees of ph pharmaceutical industry. And they're making these decisions. And of course, this is, they have a huge conflict of interest because they may actually have developed a vaccine themselves. And yet they're, all they're asked to do is sign a waiver. And that's only been in the last three years. Before three years ago, they didn't even have to sign a waiver. All they had to do was nothing. But with public pressure, they had to sign a waiver each year. That doesn't actually stop them from participating in the discussions or even from voting. And it's no, no um, surprise that parents are not trusting these people when they know that there are these conflicts of interest. So that's something that's very worrying. And then when you even look at the very top, the former CDC director under um, George W. Bush, 
uh, a, a woman named Dr. Julie Gerberding, when she finished her, um, her post at the CDC, when he left office, she did her one year cooling off period. And then guess what she did? What's that? Instantly, she became president of Merck vaccines globally. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you really have to ask yourself what kinds of things was she doing when she was at CDC before she went to Merck um, in order to make to, to sort of pave the way for further vaccine use. And, you know, this was during the time of, of Gardasil. So well, of you really I have mean, to ask yourself. Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but no, obviously it's a huge conflict of interest. But the good news is that, you know, people are finally starting to wake up to this, uh, largely because of people like you and, and the wonderful families and activists that you featured in the documentary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought it was interesting when Dr. Robert Sears, he's the pediatrician that appeared in the film, and, you know, he wrote the bestseller. It was, uh, well, it's called The Vaccine Book, mm -hmm. Making the Right Decision for Your Child. He was advised by his colleagues, uh, man, I wouldn't write the book if I were you, because they knew the kind of backlash that he would probably get from the mainstream uh, medical industry, if you will. And um, But thankfully, you know, he had the courage to write the book and, and it became a bestseller, but not without tremendous backlash from the pharmaceutical industry and the mainstream media as well. After all, they, you know, they pretty much go together hand in hand. But I thought, you know, you must certainly be uh, experiencing the same thing what kind of a backlash have you received, even though your movie is critically acclaimed, it's winning awards all across the country and the world, but you must have uh, witnessed some sort of backlash yourself? Well, we have definitely, I, mean, I personally have actually been subjected to some pretty nasty attacks online, you know, in blogs and things like that, which are largely unfounded. People just going after crazy things. Most of these people, I believe, are bloggers who are, paid by the pharmaceutical industry to try and discredit anyone who um, questions the safety of vaccines or other medical products. I don't think it's just about vaccines, but clearly vaccines are a sacred cow that, that are, are, you know, you don't go near without reaping some kind of negative backlash. And so um, my computers crashed a lot. Somebody hacked into my, um, into our website and deleted all my emails. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, my phone's been tapped. And um, there's no doubt all sorts of strange things going on whenever I'm communicating. You know, I sometimes hear people on the line. And, um, and if I say something like, I was having a conversation with someone I was about to do a radio interview with. And as I was speaking, I said to her, do you hear those voices? I could hear two men's voices in the background. And as soon as I said it, instantly they stopped. And she, she said, yeah, you know, I heard it too. And then there was just silence. And I, I, I'm assuming they just forgot to push mute or something. <laughs> Well, it's kind of spooky, you know, but, you know, and it didn't take me very long. I found a hit piece. I did a little bit of research, and there was a hit piece about the greater good. It was on the sciencebasedmedicine.org website. We talked earlier. David Gorski wrote a, it was a mean-spirited attack on, on the, the documentary, in my opinion. And come to find out, he has connections to the pharmaceutical industry and financial ties as well. So no doubt they are, you know, they're going to go after you. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar a year industry. And with that kind of money, no doubt, you know, that's, that's enough to buy a lot of corruption. Mm. Well, the vaccine industry will probably do about 35 billion in revenues in the next year or two. So we're talking huge. And it's, this is at a time when the pharmaceutical industry has no further blockbusters. Their blockbusters have all gone off patent. And so they've actually been experiencing flat to declining revenues. And that's a real problem for them. And given that they have no liability when it comes to, to vaccine manufacture, you can understand why it's such an appealing thing for them. And so I think that our film really threatens them more than, than anyone because of the fact that it's fair and balanced because, um, you know, we show both sides and we interviewed people who are extremely pro vaccine. And then we interviewed people who have serious questions about vaccines and we allow them to argue their cases, make their points, share their stories so that the viewer can then decide what they want to do. And I think that that is much more threatening than a polemic, much more, um, something that touches many more people and can open more people's hearts and minds because they can actually make the choice for themselves who they choose to believe. Well, absolutely. And I, and I think that's why it's so effective because it does show both sides. Um, it's put together very well. You know, it's, it's real slick. It's got nice graphics. And, you know, that's what we need in order to get the word out as well. And you have competition. I mean, you're going up against these, these Gardasil ads, for example, that appear on MTV. And so, you know, it's nice to have something 
that we could get out there to the people. You know, we need to get this to every doctor, every pediatrician, every nurse, you know, force them to make the moral decision. And it wouldn't be a bad idea, obviously, to get this in the hands of expected uh, mothers, any family who's, who's getting ready to have a child or have children. You know, they, they need to take a look at this as well, and they'll be glad that uh, they did. Now, in closing, because we're almost out of time, I wanted to, uh, you to talk about, well, basically, what's next for the greater good? I understand you have screenings that are planned in, in several cities in the future. And, um, you know, talk about those, and then what's, what's planned for the future? So um, we're just going through a, a website relaunch. It'll be up the new site in another week or two weeks. And um, once that's up, people will be able to go and search online at greatergoodmovie.org to find out exactly where the screenings are going to be. And you're going to be, I'm sorry, you're going to take questions for the audience at these screenings as well? Yes, absolutely. Oh, well, awesome. Essentially, essentially what's happening is we won't necessarily be at every single screening, but there will be people who are facilitating. So we've had over a thousand people sign up who want to host screenings in their communities. And this might be at their church, it might be in their home, it might be at their school or their community center, but they all want to bring together their community so that they can talk about this really, really critical issue and why it is that so many of our kids are so sick. Help people to understand it's not black and white. Um, we've all been led to believe it's black and white, that this issue is all done, and, and that's just not the case. And so they're going to bring people together to have these conversations. And we have, like I say, about a thousand people signed up to do that. Um, in addition to that, we, I'm going to a big libertarian festival, Freedom Fest, in Las Vegas in July to go and appear there and show the film a couple of times and um, to moderate a vaccine debate between two physicians. And those kinds of things are happening all the time. We won an award from the University of Alabama at Birmingham mm -hmm. for our treatment of a critical issue to public health. And we've been invited to go there and do a big event there in the fall. So those kinds of things are happening, going to more universities, more festivals, um, and ultimately, hopefully, reaching every hospital and physicians. There was a, um, something that I'm most excited about was that at our own local film festival here in Sun Valley, Idaho, where I live in March, a woman introduced the film who's involved with our local hospital. And she happens to be connected to a network of um, 50 some hospitals in the Northwestern United States. Hmm. And she's also, she's a medical consultant. She's also connected to about 80,000 doctors who are insured by this company that she consults with an insurance company. And she wants to get the film to all those hospitals and also make it required viewing for those 80,000 doctors. So we're working on a program where we would get the film shown to all these physicians and to all these hospitals to help these medical um, professionals understand that this is something that warrants further investigation and that they may not know or understand the whole story. And can I just add one other thing on this because I think it's really critical. Of I've been the last three or four months I've been working on compiling a catalog of science and I'm almost complete, although it'll probably never complete because the science continues to grow. But at this point I have over 160 papers that have been published in mainstream peer reviewed medical journals that document document unexplained infant death, autism, learning disabilities, rheumatoid arthritis, um, allergies, asthma, all these things after vaccinations or their components. And it also connects the dots for the layperson so people can understand that there's a body of science that connects neurological and immune damage. And there's a body of science that connects neurological, immune, and gut damage, and then the development of all those systems and their functioning. And so what I do is I go through and help people to understand how these things are connected, how much science there is, and why we need to do more work. And I'm really excited because I don't think this exists anywhere else in the world. And I really feel very strongly that this is going to be a tool that will be so effective in helping these medical professionals to understand why they need to open their minds and their hearts on this issue. Wow, you are amazing. That's all. Well, I didn't think you were the kind of person to just make a documentary and then call it a day. I mean, obviously, this is the kind of thing that'll affect you for the rest of your life as well. So you're committed, and uh, we applaud you for it. You're truly a hero in my book, along with all the wonderful families and the activists that appeared in the film, The Greater Good. Um, real quick, can we, those schedules you're talking about, I'd love to go see one of the debates. Maybe we can get a reporter out there in Vegas or something. The debates would be very interesting. Are all those schedules listed on the website? If you go to Freedom Fest, okay. I think it's freedomfest.com. They should be on there. Okay. All yeah. right, we'll check it out. 
Well, Leslie, thank you again for joining us. It's been awesome. Um, I really look forward to having you on the show again sometime, hopefully in the near future. Until then, thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about this critical issue. Okay, take care. All right, and I'm not going to lie to you folks, this is a tear jerker at times. Uh, there was one point where I, I literally had to stop the DVD and kind of compose myself because, um, like I said, it's, uh, it's very emotionally charged. And, you know, if, if this doesn't get you emotionally charged, then you don't have a soul, okay? You're not human. So, but uh, the good news is that as sad as it is at times, it's also extremely empowering. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and that's because we finally have the tool we need right here to pass this along and wake people up and get them out of their trance. So the DVD is available on our website. It's InfoWarsShop.com. That's right. And you can also purchase it at the greatergood.org website. So uh, get this out to doctors, pediatricians, nurses alike. Force them to make a moral decision. So uh, that's going to do it for our broadcast. Uh, we will be back, God willing, next Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Until then, have a fantastic weekend. and look forward to seeing you right here again next Monday. Good night.